гражданская война. Все будет хорошо, не переживайте. Мы находимся в штабе. 7 часов 30 минут утра под контролем военные объекты Ростов. It's June 2023. Russia's Wagner Mercenary Group, one of the Kremlin's most prized units, has seized the command headquarters for Russia's war in Ukraine and is now on the march to Moscow. Защитим и наш народ, и нашу государственность от любых угроз. В том числе от внутреннего предательства. As the National Guard prepared to defend the capital against a band of rogue mercenaries, Wagner stood down, but not quietly. <laughs> Yevgeny Prigozhin, the man behind the insurrection, cheered as he and his men vacate the Russian city of Rostov. Two months later, Prigozhin is dead, his plane suffering a mysterious incident on approach into Moscow. Mr. President, are you a killer? Two years before that mysterious plane crash, killing one of his oldest allies in a ball of flames, I asked him directly. Mr. President, are you a killer? Послушайте меня. Значит, я таких обвинений слышал десятки. Я при этом всегда руководствуюсь интересами российского государства и русского народа. This is one of the key lines the Russian leader and those closest to him use to describe Vladimir Putin. Here is Dmitry Peskov, Putin's long-serving spokesman, extolling Putin's particular civic mindset. You've known President Putin for 20 years? More. Can you describe the difference between the president that you met and the president that you now work with? Well, uh, you have to understand that President Putin has uh, been doing his job for 22 years already. And uh, he knows the outside and inside part of the relationship with the West, of his country. And he knows to what extent West was ready and is ready to take into account Russia's concerns and Russia's problems. And he understands perfectly well that this extent is zero. West is not willing to take into account Russia's concerns. He didn't think that. And that's, why, and that's why he's angry. And that's why he's determined. And that's why he's tough to ensure his countries that he's in charge of national interests. It is a view shared by the Soviet-born men and some women who surround him. They sit around tables, ruling Russia like a cartel. Putin is no lone dictator. He's more like a kingpin, the leader of a very Russian team of rivals, united in public, often divided in private. That helps explain why, to maintain loyalty, Putin's friends are so richly rewarded, while traitors are punished. This is uh, probably uh, uh, the most important element of the whole mechanism of power in Russia, that it's a team. It's not a political party like in, uh, in the West. It's not a kind of a coalition or something like this. It's the leader and the team. And this team is united. Because uh, this team can survive only as a team. That's why no one is leaving the ship. Taking to social media to publicize private divisions. <laughs> Revealing vulnerabilities in Putin's regime. For now, at least, the regime has won.
The war in Ukraine is changing Russia, straining already fraught relations between the people Putin presides over. And yet, perhaps, the war is changing nothing. Putin's tactics as familiar as ever. Putin's regime, surviving a dire political crisis, appearing more determined than ever to fight their war. I'm extremely pessimistic, to be honest. I think that uh, we are looking at probably five, seven years of war. The world may have to deal with Putin's people and his killer instinct for a long time to come. This was President Putin over the summer, taking selfies with adoring fans, even offering kisses. The kind of Russian retail politics not seen from him in years. The very same President Putin, who until recently sat at a COVID safe distance from other world leaders. Fine, just fine. How are you? And even his most senior advisors. Last year, lashed out at the world with unbridled bitterness, branding America an empire of lies and launching the largest conflict on the European continent since the Second World War. And who has been accused of assassinating his opponents despite his consistent denials? Russia's supposedly decisive leader often delays decisions or even changes his mind. Initially, he called the men who follow Pogozhin traitors. Then seemed to forgive them. A figure shrouded in spin, the subject of endless speculation, but who is now wanted by the International Criminal Court for alleged Russian crimes in Ukraine, including the unlawful deportation of children. Putin, described over the years as devoid of emotion, has over time become consumed by a slow burning fury toward the West. Наши западные коллеги, особенно из США, не просто устанавливают произвольно такие правила, но и поучают при этом, кто и как должен их исполнять, кто и как должен вообще себя вести. Вы кто такие вообще? Какое вы имеете право кого-то предупреждать? Putin is a man who believes in loyal and long relationships, but he is equally single-minded, relentlessly putting his interests, and he will later claim, his country first. In 2013, looking incredibly uncomfortable, he and his wife announced their marriage was over. Uh, с абсолютной публичностью. Кому-то это нравится, кому-то нет. Но есть люди, которые совершенно с этим несовместимы. Вот Людмила Александровна отстояла вахту 8 лет уже 9 даже, да? 9 лет. Но, так что, в общем, это общее решение. Да, я присоединяюсь к славе Владимира Владимировича. Это действительно было нашим общим решением. И наш брак завершен в связи действительно с тем, что мы практически не видимся. The video is staged managed, but it is a pivotal moment. Putin's identity has fused with that of Russia. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Putin's one-track mind would over decades, foster a messianic drive to restore Russian glory. To understand his obsession with history, 
as well as his long friendships and influences, you have to go back to the beginning. Every day, more people die. Cold. Disease. Hunger. This was Leningrad in its darkest hour. Deep in Putin's DNA is an imprint that has followed him forever. War. The city where he spent his character-forming early years, St. Petersburg, called in the Soviet era Leningrad, suffered a terrible siege from Hitler's army. Putin's identity and that of many closest to him, also from St. Petersburg, is intertwined with that Leningrad history. World War II traumas were inherited by generations of Soviets like him. Listen to him here, dwelling on the war and its legacy, while accepting Russia's nomination as World Cup hosts. I was born in Leningrad. And as you know, during World War II, Leningrad went through 900 days of blockade. Leningrad was bombed every day. No electricity, no running water, no food, and no heat. No heat in a Russian winter. Putin himself never witnessed the Second World War, yet he's made it part of modern Russia's mythology, encouraging an annual parade, a tribute to those who fought, including his father. Putin's youth was immersed in both post-war poverty and a sense of pride for emerging victorious. Vladimir Putin was born in October 1952. He spent the first part of his life in this street, living in an apartment in this building. These are some of the facts that we know, but there's a lot that we don't know because President Putin famously doesn't like people prying into his personal life. He did allow three journalists to write an autobiography 20 years ago, but even that was really part of his political campaign to introduce himself to Russia. It was the story that he wanted to tell, but then everything in Vladimir Putin's life is a story that he wants to tell. Not surprisingly, in St. Petersburg, simple stories of survival are celebrated. A childhood fable from that autobiography, he would chase vermin in this courtyard. One day, he says, he cornered a giant rat. Suddenly, the rat turned and lashed at him. It taught the young Putin a lesson about being cornered. Many times, Putin and the Kremlin have used that story to teach his opponents a lesson about Putin. Here is one of his closest allies, the Belarus president, reinforcing the message to me just last year. Another early influence, according to Putin's own account, was Russia's wartime leader, Stalin. Putin's first year of life was the last year of Stalin's iron-fisted rule over Russia. His Soviet education taught patriotism and ideology. Ask him what he wants to be when he grows up. A pilot. A soldier. Tankistum. A tankman. A what man? A tankman. A tankman. But a young Vladimir Putin found his calling at a small cinema in this St. Petersburg building. It said that here, Putin saw a popular show starring a Stalin-era KGB agent during the Second World War. Putin would join the KGB just two years later. This building was its imposing Leningrad headquarters. He would work with the KGB for the next 15 years. President Putin describes himself in his autobiography as determined to join the KGB. It's now the headquarters of the FSB, Russian intelligence, and many of the people who worked in the KGB with the president still work in his government. From what we know, he spent his time as a KGB officer living in relative obscurity. 
with his wife Ludmilla in Dresden. Some accounts suggest Putin was just an office clerk. Some have claimed he was active in recruiting and running local spies. It was at this time, posted to East Germany, that Russia's former deputy foreign minister, Andrei Fedorov, says he met Vladimir Putin for the first time. I've seen just him as a person, but uh, he was looking like a normal man, so... A normal KGB officer? No, 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 no. He never looked like a KGB officer, no, absolutely no, absolutely no. Some people are saying that he was even shy. People talk about his charisma now. Did you see that charisma when you first met him? Uh, no, 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 at that time, of course not. The charisma came to him when he uh, became president. The KGB extolled loyalty. And in these early years, Putin made friendships that endure today, while learning to despise those who oppose him. Opposition leader Alexei Navalny and his team have investigated Putin's past and his wealth for more than a decade. In 2021, after the FSB failed to assassinate Navalny with a nerve agent, and while he was recovering in Germany, Navalny located what he says is the file that the East German secret police kept on the young KGB officer in Dresden. That research revealed Putin's decade-long connection to a particular friend and ally. Sergei Chemisov, one of the many associates who today benefit handsomely from their proximity to Putin. Chemisov is the lavishly wealthy head of Rostec, Russia's massive military-industrial conglomerate. And like many of Putin's old associates, he is reluctant to talk about their shared past. I interviewed him in Dubai in 2021, and with a smile and a laugh, he brushed off a number of questions about the boss. You've known him since the KGB days. There's very little we know about him then. What was he like? What did he do in Germany with you? So you can't talk about it? People say that he recruited agents in Germany as a KGB officer. Is that is that right? Was that what you were doing? Putin's time in Dresden in the late 1980s had another impact too. It was here that Putin saw his Soviet KGB world begin to collapse. A process that would end with the dissolution of the Soviet Union. These images, moments that for many people in Eastern Europe signified a long-awaited liberation meant for many in Putin's generation a loss of empire, leaving a deep scar, an aversion to revolution and uprisings that would stay with him forever. Anyone who doesn't regret the passing of the Soviet Union doesn't have a heart, Putin would later say. Anyone who wants it restored has no brain. I think that he has, inside him, he has a feeling that he has a mission. And part of the mission is to, to rearrange uh, the things which has happened in 1991. And this is driving force for him. He's not living for today. He's living for tomorrow, for, to fulfill his mission. That the 1990s had such an impact on Putin is hardly surprising. When he returned to Leningrad, his city and nation was in crisis. As the Soviet Union disintegrated, Putin resigned from the KGB. Once again, war was everywhere. We already know that war was part of his personal history. It would be a constant presence in his presidential life. In Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, corruption and gang warfare engulfed the city, while deadly fighting exploded across the Soviet Union over resources, borders, and national identities, culminating in a bloody conflict in Chechnya, which was seeking its own independence. Amid this chaotic new world, Russia's future leader would make more enduring alliances and learn more lessons 
Putin found work in the office of St. Petersburg's new Democratic mayor, Anatoly Sobchak. It is revealing to list those he met then who are still with him now. Dmitry Medvedev, who would one day become president and serve as Putin's prime minister for many years. Sergei Narishkin, today Putin's foreign intelligence chief. Igor Sechin, today head of Rosneft, Russia's state-owned oil company. Alexei Miller, now the head of Gazprom. And Yuri Kulvachuk, chairman of the Bank of Russia, known as Putin's banker. Kulvachuk today is perhaps one of Putin's most influential and anti-Western advisors. He's also one of those who hides in the shadows. We could find no images of the men together. All of these men, in one way or another, would follow Putin as he rose through the ranks of government to the Kremlin. His experiences became their experiences. All would become rich. In 1998, Putin was appointed head of the FSB, the successor to the KGB, and in 1999 became acting prime minister. The bloodshed kept flowing. The second Chechen war and apartment bombings in Moscow and other cities. His handling of those apartment attacks increased his popularity, while some journalists questioned who was behind them. One of those journalists, Anna Polakovskaya, was shot dead. The first of many. As Putin ascended to the presidency, Russia was indisputably far weaker than America and the West. Boris Yeltsin had presided over a painful decade, at times even appearing drunk in public. Then, in 1999, as the public tuned in to the Kremlin's traditional New Year address, President Yeltsin, modern Russia's first elected leader, stunned the world. <laughs> This was the moment most were introduced to President Putin. Дорогие друзья, сегодня в новогоднюю ночь я, как и вы, с родными и друзьями собирался выслушать слова приветствия президента России Бориса Николаевича Ельцина. Но вышло иначе. Сегодня. A brilliant New Year's dawn in Red Square. Russians waking up to a new century, a new president. Vladimir Putin, Russia's new acting president, was already on the campaign trail New Year's morning, meeting his troops in Chechnya, handing out hunting knives, posing for the cameras. Vladimir Putin, a virtual political unknown three months ago, now clearly in charge of Russia. His sudden rise to power, begging the question, who is Mr. Putin? It is an extraordinary scene, emblematic of Putin and his people's deep desire to be accepted. Just over a decade ago, the Russian president singing the popular American ballad, Blueberry Hill, to Hollywood celebrities. Kevin Costner, Sharon Stone, Kurt Russell, Goldie Hawn, all at the children's charity event. But another image he cultivated for his own people's consumption was very different. Not a singer, but a strong man. We've all seen him riding a horse, bare-chested fishing, shooting, posing with a tiger. The Russian people loved it. His charisma is based on what Russian people likes, decisive decision-making. So he knows and he takes responsibility for his decision. This makes him a leader. Ability to make decisions and to be responsible for implementation of this decision. Putin is a sports enthusiast. Hockey is one of his favorites.
and judo was an obsession from childhood. Much has been written of Putin adopting its lessons to overpower political enemies. Now in his 70s, his closest aides say he has not slowed down. So he's, he, he's a man of around a clock work. He's, he's a workaholic. He continues. He's a, he's a sportsman and, and uh, he's, continuing, he's continuing his style. From so many perspectives, Putin seems a contradictory character. Forgotten by many today is how at first he apparently enthusiastically embraced the West. Personally close to President Bush, I found him to be very straightforward and trustworthy. And we had a very good dialogue. I was able to um, get a sense of his soul. He's a man deeply committed to his country and the best interests of his country. He was the first world leader to call the White House after 9-11. Here he is at Ground Zero with then Mayor Rudy Giuliani and later unveiling a 9-11 memorial. After the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, his name would be removed. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States and the President of the Russian Federation. But back then, he supported America's invasion of Afghanistan. And while he questioned the US invasion of Iraq, when his friend, British Prime Minister Tony Blair, afforded him a state visit to meet the Queen, he addressed her in Buckingham Palace in English. I would like to express to Her Majesty the Queen and the people of the United Kingdom our sincere condolences with the loss of the British soldiers in Iraq. Later, Putin said he felt uncomfortable, and he looked it. By coming here, you give Prince Philip and me a chance to repay the generous hospitality given to us on my state visit to Russia in 1994. Did the street fighter from St. Petersburg feel out of place? Were his seemingly international democratic ideals beginning to wane? or even just a facade all along. He was furious when, in 2001, President Bush unilaterally pulled out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty, saying America needed to defend itself against countries like Iran and North Korea. But President Putin interpreted it as a threat to Russia, his worldview as ever shaped by violence, conflict and strife. Russian troops invaded Chechnya in 1999, when three apartments were bombed. Today, President Putin messaged the victims' families in these latest attacks, saying blood has been shed again. He vowed to punish those responsible. Over time, Putin's view of global conflicts and security would be a crucial part of his break with the West. In a famous 2007 speech in Munich, he railed against what he said was growing American unilateralism and global dominance, a moment that many later came to view as pivotal. Это мир одного хозяина, одного суверена. И это в конечном итоге губительно не только для всех, кто находится в рамках этой системы, но и для самого суверена, потому что разрушает его изнутри. If you're trying to reread this speech, you will see that, that, that... Uh, lots of things that he was warning about. They are now out there in the European continent. In 2008, as Georgia looked to join NATO and perhaps Europe, Putin, defying Washington, ordered tanks to seize two Georgian regions. Ironically, Western wars slowly fueled his fury too. He opposed the West's failed 2011 intervention in Libya and hated seeing his ally, the autocrat, Muammar Gaddafi pulled from a hole, humiliated and executed. For years, he would oscillate between reaching out to the West and retreating into nationalism. 2014 would begin with Russia's Sochi Olympics. But weeks later, he would stun the world by mobilizing his military again. Backing proxy forces in eastern Ukraine, annexing Crimea. 
the Sochi Olympics and the 2014 events happened within weeks of each other. Yes, unfortunately. What, what was President Putin's feeling at that time? He's at the one the We're one. We're very sorry on about that. We're very sorry about that. He'd watched in horror as a pro-Western uprising unfolded. An election in Ukraine bringing President Putin's favoured leader to power was followed by an uprising turning Ukraine toward Europe and the West. Everything that Putin worried about for years. Putin saw this as another CIA operation, something he had been increasingly obsessed with over the years even viewing his own domestic opposition as a Western Front when challenged at home in 2012. Despite the opposition on the streets, he was re-elected that year. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin! Today, his first day as president-elect, he was already talking and acting tough. He told reporters that the tear they saw running down his cheek at last night's victory celebration wasn't emotion at all, but just a gust of wind, he said. His victory in Russia's presidential election was so solid that even taking into account all of the reports of vote fraud, and there were many, he would still have won a majority. What was the atmosphere like in the Kremlin at that time? Was there deep concern, uh, tension? Well, it was, there was a tension, uh, a certain tension, of course. It was also an element of an influence coming from outside in that story. Don't forget about that. There was a, quite a, a sensible amount of money spent from the outside. President Putin believed that, that the outside well, world was trying to influence it's not a matter of Russian believing domestic or, politics. There was not a believing or not believing. It's not an issue of believing. It's an issue of knowing or not knowing. We know a lot about that uh, interference in our domestic affairs. In retrospect, the Kremlin's belief that America, and particularly Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, had influenced Russian protests and politics were a turning point. The Kremlin's answer came in 2015. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. When Russia attempted to influence America's presidential election, simultaneously launching a bloody intervention in Syria's civil war. Washington wanted Syria's dictator gone. Putin did not. Russia's message, anything you can do, we can do better. It marked perhaps President Putin's zenith on the world stage. A Russian leader with the upper hand over even America's president. Presidents Putin and Trump met in person at least five times, and every time amid a political storm. Reaffirming Putin's perception that American power was in decline, emboldening him. President Putin seemed dominant, both diplomatically and in war. But it was at home, dealing with those who oppose his leadership, where he had developed his most ruthless killer instinct. Oligarch Michael Kordakovsky was thrown in jail. Others, such as journalists and politicians, were killed. In 2006, KGB defector Alexander Litvinenko was handed a slow death in a London hospital, poisoned with radioactive polonium dropped in his tea. Opposition leader Boris Nemtsov shot dead just outside the walls of the Kremlin, one day before a planned opposition protest. And then there's Alexei Navalny, who since returning to Russia has essentially been sentenced to life in prison. Finally this year, making headlines around the world, the assassination of a longtime friend who challenged Putin's regime. А теперь слушайте меня, сука, Это чьи-то, отцы! It's April 2023. Putin's private warlord, Yevgeny Pogozhin, rages into the camera, furious with the men who run the Russian military, accusing them of withholding key war-fighting supplies. 
Шойгу! Герасимов! Где боеприпасы? A private turf war exploding in public. Pogozhin was one of those allies who met Putin in St. Petersburg decades earlier. He ran the restaurant where they all hung out. That's why they called him Putin's chef. And like so many of them, he made a lot of money. First catering for the Kremlin, finally running a private army and clandestine foreign policy for Russia. Fast forward to June 2023, and Pogozhin's Wagner mercenaries are on the march towards Moscow, shooting down Russian helicopters sent to confront them. Months later, a private plane with Yevgeny Pogozhin on the passenger list is brought down between Moscow and St. Petersburg. Andrei Soldatov analyzes Russia's security services and power structures. He now lives in exile in London. Since the start of Russia's war, he's been placed on Russia's federal wanted list. Well, what is clear now that Prigozhin didn't have an intention to get rid of Putin. What he wanted to do, he wanted to, to get a better deal with Putin. Uh, and then things uh, went out of control, but not for Putin. Prigozhin had taken on not Putin, according to him, but the people around Putin. One lesson of Prigozhin's unceremonious end is that you cannot separate Putin from his people. At the head of Russia's military sits the man Prigozhin wanted to remove. Sergei Shoigu, Russia's defense minister, has his own long history with President Putin. The two men famously vacation together. Here they are on a hunting expedition in the wilds of Siberia. Shoigu was one of the architects of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, a war that has made Russia's military once again one of the most important institutions in the country. It is no surprise then that Putin chose to side with his military, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, and the head of Russia's general staff, Valery Gerasimov. Putin learned a lesson from Stalin that in the middle of the war, you cannot just go punishing your generals because you need to have some military commanders in the war. That is why he is attacking and not attacking his military. His main thing is just to remind them who is in control. Today, the military are one strand of a spider's web of wealthy, powerful and elite that make up Putin's power base. Men and some women who can be seen on full display, listening attentively at carefully choreographed events. Interconnected military and security chiefs, bureaucrats, oligarchs, warlords and personal friends of the president. The powerful and hardline Dmitry Patrushev Russia's equivalent of national security advisor. His head of internal intelligence, the FSB, formerly the KGB, Alexander Bortnikov. These are members of his security council, signing off on his decision to invade Ukraine. There's his longtime foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, once famously friendly with former Secretary of State John Kerry. The current prime minister, Mikhail Mishustin. The speaker of the parliament, Vacheslav Volodin and his former bodyguard, now running the National Guard, Viktor Zolotov. Putin's importance, that he is the boss, underscored by him at this moment, when he mocked another man that he has known for decades since St. Petersburg, Sergei Narishkin, the head of foreign intelligence, the Russian CIA. Narishkin stumbles as a smirking Putin publicly humiliates him, for seeming not to fully support the invasion of Ukraine. Remember, this is how Putin is treating longtime friends. But there is also evidence that many of these people, particularly the security and intelligence officials known as Siloviki, are more powerful than ever. Certainly now, they are all in this together. The military now understand that finally they have a really crucial role in Russian society and remember that for many years, for almost 20 years, they felt very bad about uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union but mostly because they lost their social status. Now they got it back, right? They are the most important part of 
what was what is going on in the country so why we would want to have peace the ukraine conflict has been elevating the more hardline voices around putin like the warlord ramzan kadyrov installed by putin from the ruins of the chechen wars here he sits listening to his president with tears in his eyes Today, those who were once called liberals are silent or seem to have switched sides, like Dmitry Medvedev. Here he is with Putin in 2015, Putin's love for the political publicity stunt undiminished. For four years, Medvedev had replaced Putin as president until Putin unapologetically took back the presidency. Medvedev, once viewed as a supporter of the West, Today, tweets pro-war propaganda and nuclear threats. Much has changed in Putin's regime, even while many of the people are the same. Even those who say they oppose him. Take Ksenia Sobchak, daughter of Anatoly Sobchak, one of Putin's early liberal mentors. She's even rumored to be Putin's goddaughter, something she denies. I joined her when she ran for president in 2018. That's the Kremlin. What do you think when you look at this? Because when you stand here, because this is what you are bidding to yes, be I, the leader of. Well, my dream is to see this Kremlin wall opened for all the people. I want my government to be transparent. I want to open those um, doors so people can go inside. Few Russians took her seriously, even then. But it is unlikely that today, after years of crackdowns on opposition, we would still be able to have that conversation in Red Square. If there is a risk to President Putin today, it's not from pro-Western reformers. Most of them are silenced, dead or in jail. But from hardline nationalists. Yevgeny Pogozhin supported the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In fact... He wanted more war, but his insurrection threatened a return to Russia's chaotic time before Putin, back to the lawless 1990s. That was one reason why the Kremlin considered him so dangerous. For many people, including Putin, the 1990s was a time of complete political instability. So for Putin, it was really, really important to suppress any sign that this kind of thing might happen. President Putin may very well be a player on the world stage for a long time into the future. His authority is now inextricably tied to the Ukraine war. If Kyiv gained a decisive advantage, Putin would be politically wounded at home, perhaps irreversibly. But for now, Ukraine, with all its complications and setbacks, appears to have turned a short military operation into a long-running war of attrition. The costs of which have prompted some speculation about his decision-making skills and general health. You've denied several times that he's terminally ill, as has been suggested. Um, in many reports, you, you've read them yourself. And yet people have suggested that at times he has seemed as if he is limping, as if he's shaking, as if he's gripping the table. Can you address that once and for all? I can tell you one thing, that yesterday he was playing hockey. And then think about his health by yourself. Critics describe him as the head of a cartel, plundering their country's wealth for their own gain. Indeed, reports say Yevgeny Pogozhin's profitable Wagner Group is being carved up by Putin loyalists. Those who support Putin portray him as trying to hold his country together. One irony is the protracted Ukraine war is making that task more challenging. Some in Russia want the war to end soon. Others say it hasn't been prosecuted with enough ruthless determination. The death of Prigozhin sent a message that public contradictions will not be tolerated. I think he might stay in power for for years to come. He's uh, quite a good tactician. He is not really good at strategy, but he knows his people. He knows how to control people, how to spread fear. He's really good at it. So it means that we 
we might have a really, really long war uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. The views of the elite are one thing. One of Putin's major challenges will be maintaining the public support, something that for now appears secured by propaganda. Only in some ways, it doesn't really matter if Putin's still the leader. It will still be the same idea. Even with Putin's gun, uh, still you have Russian society getting more and more used to this war. You have Russian bureaucracy getting more and more involved in this war. They're signed up. Yeah, that's not for that, yeah. The whole country has been conscripted, even though the whole country hasn't been conscripted. Yes, yes, yes. It's not a total mobilization, but to some extent, Putin found a way hard to, to have his mobilization. A long war is Putin's strategy. Russia knows the West has run out of patience before. And while Putin waits, he is cementing relationships with other leaders who see the West as an adversary. His headline-making meeting with North Korea's Kim Jong-un, a partnership that may supply munitions to Russia's front line. And most importantly, his friendship without limits with China's President Xi Jinping. Russia is turning east. Putin and Xi open about their view that Western power is on the way. Perhaps Putin's fascination and resentment towards the West are two sides of the same coin. Today, the resentment has won out. The way he tells it, he had no choice. If you had such a chance, they would say to Putin about the 2000... What did he say? I would say, you're going to go on the right road, товарищ. What... От чего бы предупредил? От э, избыточной, от наивности и избыточной доверчивости в отношении наших так называемых партнеров. There are looming questions for the future. For example, what happens when all those fighters return from war? From that perspective, the Bogosian Wagner mutiny may be a taste of things to come. President Putin began his leadership with Russia in turmoil. When he leaves office, whenever and however that happens, what country will he leave behind? Do you worry that the longer you are in power and without any sign of someone to replace you, the more instability there may be when you finally do choose to leave office? Настолько связал всю свою судьбу с судьбой страны, нет для меня в жизни нет никакой другой, более значимой задачи, чем укрепление России. Поэтому, если любой другой человек, и я увижу, что какой-то человек, даже если он критически относится к каким-то сферам моей деятельности, но я увижу, что это человек с конструктивными взглядами, с, человек предан стране, готов готов положить на алтарь Отечества не просто годы, а всю свою жизнь. Но как бы он не относился ко мне лично, я сделаю все, чтобы таких людей, такие люди были поддержаны. Когда-то, разумеется, это естественный процесс биологический, когда-то нам всем будет замена. И вам <laughs> на своем месте, мне на своем. Но я уверен, что фундаментальная основа российской государственности, российской экономики, политической системы будут такими, что она будет твердо стоять на ногах и уверенно смотреть в будущее. In many ways, who President Putin is was reflected in Yevgeny Prigozhin. They both came from St. Petersburg. Their relationship revolved around violence and war. Ultimately, Prigozhin was both a friend and a traitor. Loyalty and treason, the two themes in Putin's life. Prigozhin is gone. One day, Putin will be too. But the Russia Putin leaves behind, molded in his image, with its army, nuclear weapons and defiance, will be a challenge for the West for years to come.
Россия! Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.